Oh, this panel is about the Global Entrepreneurial University Metrics Project. We invited to be here Professor Henry Etzkovitz that created this project. Prof Professor Henry Etzkovitz is the president of the International Triple Helix Institute. He is also a former visiting lecturer in science, technology, and society program at Stanford University. If Stanford University. At Skovitz, the School of, of International Reputation Innovation Studies as the originator of the entrepreneurial university and the triple helix concepts that link the university with the industry and government at the national and the regional level in order to promote the innovation. Professor Henry Skovitz is, uh, is author of the Triple Helix University Industry Government Innovation in Action, his last book, and he also with a lot of the other books about the MIT, about the gender in the university and the others. So Professor Henry Skovitz, we would like to listen to your talk about the, our project, the Global Entrepreneurial University Metrics Project. Thank you, Marisa. So it's good to be with you for the fourth workshop. And so I'll give a little background <clears throat> on how the first workshop came about. <clears throat> first, metrics is not my professional area. So how did I become involved in this project is, a, is the first question. And happened because of necessity in a way of necessity entrepreneurship. I was at a workshop in London about five years ago, and it was pointed out to me by my colleague, Lute Leidersdorf, who is a bibliometrician, who is very much involved in metrics, that the way that metrics were developing using papers and articles as the point of judging academic work that the way this was growing, this was going to drive out the entrepreneurial university model because it is not primarily expressed in papers and articles, although you can find it indirectly in co-citations, which is one direction that researchers take on it, but it is a minor area in comparison to the main of counting articles. And so my thought was, the role of the university in economic and social development, its third mission. And so uh, with a colleague uh, from uh, North Carolina State University, uh, uh, Dennis, we uh, approached the National Science Foundation in Washington for a small grant to hold a workshop on this. And this was the first meeting that took place in Holland. In Holland, because we had the funds from the international division of the NSF, which meant that you cannot use it in the US. You had to use it abroad. And so why in Holland? Because that was the site of a research group that's been studying university metrics. Uh, all aspects of the university. But their approach on the entrepreneurial university side is primarily to look at co-citations of papers between industry and university. Again, as I mentioned before, a very narrow measure. So the workshop was called and Marisa, uh, one of the participants, and she especially took the project forward by uh, establishing the project that you have been participating in in Brazil and also graduate students at University of Sao Paulo organized their own project and published a book uh, looking at the Brazilian universities. And so Guillaume had two more workshops in Silicon Valley, but its main place that it's taken off is in, is in Brazil. So I could give you further background but I think uh, I'd rather be open to questions and discussions. So, okay, we are waiting the 
questions for the audience, but before it, you have some questions to, <laughs> to do. Branca, would you like to start it? Yeah, I'd like to ask you, Professor Henry, how are you observing the entrepreneurial universities movement around the world? Okay, well, I think uh, the first point is just to say, just what you did, that it has become a movement around the world. Okay, when I first started studying this, uh, it was a very small, relatively small phenomenon, mainly out of very few places, which were considered to be exceptional, like MIT. So when I first gave a paper on this topic at the sociological meetings, the distinguished historian and sociologist Joseph Ben David said, well, if you're going to study the entrepreneurial university, well, you must study the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And I agreed with him. And I began a study of MIT, which later resulted in a book on that topic. But since then, uh, the topic has spread to universities that consider themselves a very long distance from being an entrepreneurial university. I'll give one example. I first visited the University of Singapore about 20 years ago uh, to give a talk about the entrepreneurial university. And there was one or two uh, researchers who are still active, uh, Po Kam Wang, on the topic. But the administrators who came to my talk said to me, what you're talking about is very far from the University of Singapore. Our main purpose is to train people uh, to run the administration of Singapore. Uh, we are primarily a teaching university focused on that. <clears throat> and we are moving towards becoming a research university. We are not in any way an entrepreneurial university. Well, now if you look today at the website of the University of Singapore, what do they say? They say, we are an entrepreneurial university. So what has happened is that the model has been taken up and that more and more universities see that they have to extend uh, from uh, teaching and research into economic and social development, into technology transfer, uh, into helping start uh, entrepreneurship programs. And so it's become a part of many universities that just a few years ago considered themselves to be very distant from the phenomenon. How are you? Henry, you talk about the University of Singapore and the MIT. Both are universities in developing countries. Developed countries. So what is the difference between the, the entrepreneurial university in the developing countries and the developing countries? Developed and the developing countries. Do you see any difference? Okay, well, uh, not, in, uh, not in essence. I mean, after all, uh, Singapore until recently was a developing country and it partly developed on the basis of uh, developing its universities. Uh, 30 years ago, Singapore was uh, doing offshore manufacturing and then they decided to move on to the next step, which meant upgrading the universities and establishing research institutes. So that was a, a way of developing. And so the main difference would be that the entrepreneurial university is a development strategy. But then you could say the same in a developed country. It's, it was also a development strategy for Stanford and Northern California in an era when it was not a developed country in the late 19th and early 20th century. So developing a university for the purpose of uh, useful knowledge is, is common to uh, all types of sites and is possible under various conditions. If a university is a small teaching university, it may start by using existing knowledge to spin off new businesses. Or if it's a research institute, it may begin to start teaching programs and then to start entrepreneurship activities. 
So I think it's possible from many different uh, bases. And you, of course, have seen the development, and I've been visiting with you and seeing how this phenomenon has developed in, in Brazil. Okay. Uh, do you think that there are implications of in, uh, due to the, the COVID, the, it can affect the vision of the importance of the concept of the entrepreneurial universe in the world? Do you think that the universe con continues to be the same, to be different? Well, if, if anything, it shows the need for the university to become involved in addressing practical problems facing the society. And I think we have many examples of universities that became involved in uh, developing uh, technologies to help uh, deal with uh, the disease. I just read a paper, in fact, from, uh, from Mexico uh, on this topic by Claudia Overa, uh, how more or less a triple helix response involving University of uh, Monterey, local family businesses uh, developing uh, different uh, projects uh, to address uh, COVID-19. You talk about, talk a lot about the entrepreneurial university, but can you talk uh, about the triple helix concept? People are curious to understand it better. Oh, oh sure, sure. Well, as I mentioned before, that I was advised to study the entrepreneurial university by looking at MIT. And so I studied it in the present, but I also studied the past and went into the archives. And there in reading the presidential papers from the 1930s of President Carl Compton, I found correspondence that he had with the governors of New England who had uh, helped start an organization, the New England Council bringing together the leadership of the government, of industry, and the universities of New England to try to figure out a way to address the economic crisis that was faced in the region from the early 20th century, when they were losing their industry to other parts of the country. So that's where I first found the Triple Helix, was in this group in New England that was meeting over several years to analyze the situation of their region and to come up with a strategy to address it. And the strategy that they eventually developed was to build upon the research at their universities and to translate those, that research into technology transfer into new firms. And to help move that process along, they invented what we now know of as the venture capital firm. The first one organized just after the Second World War and spread widely since. So that is the origins of the triple helix concept. And since then, we found many other examples of this kind of collaboration of the university becoming involved with local businesses, uh, with, with governments in order to move economic and social development forward. You talk about the triple helix, but you also wrote about the triple helix twins. Can you talk about the difference between one model and the other? Well, that you should probably ask uh, this evening when you have uh, Professor Joe. She's the originator of the twins concepts. So I think I'll, I'll leave that to her. But base, the basic idea is that there are many triple helices on different topics where you see collaborations between three main entities coming together. And in this case, it focuses more on the role of civil society. Okay. Branca, do you have any questions? Seu microfone está fechado. Sorry. I'd like to ask you if it's possible to talk about the triple helix spaces, because recently our research groups in Brazil wrote a paper about these spaces, 
that uh, because we analyzed the, the research groups inside Brazilian universities that uh, were developing COVID-19 uh, research and uh, products. Then uh, I think that is very important for the participants to know about these spaces of triple helix. If you can talk a little about it, please. Sure. <clears throat> well, the basic idea uh, came from uh, Mexico, from Rosalba Casas, who noticed that when research groups moved out of Mexico City uh, after the uh, earthquake in the mid 80s, that they moved to regions where there are no previous research institutes or groups, that they began to look at the problems of the region and they began to create knowledge relevant to those problems. And so she called those knowledge spaces. And so it's the knowledge that's created in response to addressing the problems of a local situation. And so uh, we developed that into the, uh, as part of the triple helix model. Thank you. Henry, in your previous studies, you talk about the, you wrote about, uh, about the quasi-firms. Can you talk about it now in the, the relationship with quasi-firms and the research groups? <clears throat> well, basically, uh, <clears throat> quasi-firm is a metaphor for a research group. Seeing that the research group has many of the characteristics of a small business firm. This is what I found in doing my, my studies, is that there's a leader of the group who's like the entrepreneur of the firm, uh, that although they're researchers, they're also carrying on organizational activities and uh, personnel management of members of the group uh, and providing a publicity for the group, even if it's attending scientific meetings. And so it had many, my, my analysis was that the research groups had many of the characteristics of the small business firm, except for the profit motive. And why did I come up with this idea? Partly because I was finding that those research groups that were forming firms, they were founding, finding that their experience in organizing the firm wasn't too different than their experience in organizing their research groups. So these were the early biotechnology firms in the 1980s. And so they would say to me in interviews, it doesn't feel that much different. What I'm doing now in helping organize this new firm than what And so it was the similarity between the two activities of running the firm outside the university and running a, a research group within the university that I came up with the idea of calling it the research group, a quasi firm. Which yeah, means that many techniques of organizational analysis for firms can be applied to the university. Do you have any questions, Branca? I think that I don't have the, I don't have questions now, but I think that the participants send the, some questions. Can you read, please? Temos perguntas pelo YouTube. There are one question here, here Henry. I know that you, uh, I know that you visited Brazil several times. But someone asked here, which economic sectors in Brazil can you offer better opportunities to develop university entrepreneurship? Entrepreneurial universe to develop activities in Brazil. Do you have an idea about it? <clears throat> uh, not a strong one. Uh, from what I've seen, 
Uh, university or entrepreneurship university? What is the difference? Do you see any difference between one and the other? Well, it's uh, unless you gave me a definition, I would see it's terminological more than some fundamental difference. There are some people use the term engaged university, but that is more to remove it from the business aspects and focus it more on social development. But basically all of these ideas have to do with the university involving itself more directly in the uses of its research. So entrepreneurial university, I use that term to denote the active role of the university. A other question here from Luisa Milagra. Uh, she, she's a Brazilian. She's now living in Netherlands. And the, she's asking, which university do you think that is more entrepreneurial in Netherlands? In which aspects the triple helix does this country still need to improve? Well, my guess is she could probably answer that question better than I could, since she's more directly involved in the Netherlands. <clears throat> What I'm most familiar with in the Netherlands, in the Netherlands was the uh, Knowledge Circle in Amsterdam, which was an initiative from outside of the university, but involved the universities in bringing together the leadership of the region to come up with new ideas for innovation and entrepreneurship. There are other questions. How is it relevant to measure the results of the university firm interactions for the firm? We saw that the studies focus more on university results than, in, than on firm results. I, I They are asking about the results of the university firm interaction between, uh, uh, by the point of view of the firms, not the universities. Mm -hmm. I mean, how to look at from the point of view of the firms? Yes, the interactions from the point of view of firms. Okay, well, I think there, there's uh, an association of uh, technology transfer offices coming from firms. And they publish a journal called Les Nouvelles. I think you might find some uh, material on it there. Uh, I have to say, this is not something that I have studied particularly, but uh, I think there are people who have looked into this. Uh, but I would also say it's a relatively, to my knowledge, under-examined area. There are different questions now about the, the current political environment, environment is strongly question the role of the government in the economy. Which role the government should play in the policy making in order to enforce triple helix objectives? Well, I think the, the government has an important role, uh, both in terms of uh, regulation and in providing resources. The original triple helix phenomenon in the Boston region, uh, government was important in changing the rules on how financial institutions operate in order to make it legal to have a venture capital firm. Before then, the rules made it very difficult for uh, there to be investments in new risky ventures. The bar was very high, so you couldn't have venture capital. And so the laws had to be changed. Also, uh, the basis for supporting research is mostly from the government. And so uh, its role there is very important. Since a lot of entrepreneurial activity, it comes on the basis of research that needs to be strongly supported. There are other questions here. Uh, studies on results of academic, the university firm relation in general use patents or publication as measure of innovation but they have limited applications in the sector outside of high tech. Which other indicators could be used? 
Okay. Well, the other indicators would be of uh, relationships established between uh, the university and, mm -hmm. and firms and the transfer of uh, useful knowledge. It doesn't have to be in the form of patents, but in the forms of new activities. So this more needs qualitative research, analysis of cases of interaction rather than counting. So that's where qualitative research will be more appropriate in order to tease out what the nature of these relationships are. But you don't have any more questions. Branca, do you have any question? No, I don't. I don't have no more questions. I don't, I don't know if some participants would like to ask something more, <laughs> but I think I think no. Uh, all the questions that presented until now are covered. Yeah, let me see here. Let me see here. No, no more questions. So, Henry, you'd like to thank you again for the participation in the, our workshop. It's a pleasure to have you here. You prefer that you have here in person. It was our original plan, but it's not, now it's impossible. But understand the next possibility to meet you again. Yes, I look forward. Uh, very good to be with you virtually uh, today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Henry. Bye bye. Thank you, Henry. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Obrigado. 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 E nós vamos ter um intervalo agora, que vai ser um pouquinho maior, porque esse, esse, essa sessão terminou antes, mas a gente volta daqui a 20 minutos para continuar o nosso workshop. Aguardamos vocês. Até logo.